So tonight is the March full moon night. It's called Pagana uh, Punyamasa in Pali and it's called Maidin Poya in Singhala. It's also again a very important occasion because this is the occasion that the Lord Buddha accepted an invitation to go back to his hometown, Kapilavattu, and then it tells the story of what happens when he got there and what happened with his father, King Sudodana, his stepmother, Mahapajapati Gotami, his wife, Yasodhara, his brother, Nanda, and his son, Rahula. So these are important stories that um, have been passed down, you know, in the tradition. And so it's good that we know these stories. This again happens in the first year after the Buddha's awakening. Yeah? If you remember last time, what had happened was that Sariputta and Moggallana had both attained arahatship and they had come to the Buddha and there had been a big gathering of monks 1250 monks gathered on the full moon night in February yeah and the Buddha gave the Owada party mokka it's a very important teaching because all the Buddhas actually give that teaching they don't all teach the party mocker in extension, but they all give this shortened teaching uh, for the monastics to live by. You know, the Buddha's teaching was very, very successful at the beginning of the sasana. Uh, that 1,250 monks, the majority of them became, came from the Kasapa brothers, the three Kasapa brothers, who converted with their own followers. Uh, so they all converted and they all went to Rajagaha, which is where this assembly took place. But following that assembly, also the Buddha's teaching was very, very successful in Rajagaha and in Magadha in general. And thousands of young men were flocking to listen to this new teaching that the Buddha was giving. They were attaining various stages of awakening and they were ordaining. In fact, it had even become something of a problem and people were complaining that all the young men in the state were ordaining and there was nobody to uh, do the work or fill the armies and so on and so forth like this. Now, the fame of the Lord Buddha also spread out from Magadha to various other parts of the country as well, into other kingdoms. So King Sudodana, who was in uh, the Sakyan country, the Sakyan Republic, which is something, I suppose, like 250 or 300 kilometers north of Magadha, across the Ganges, and up towards the Himalayas, right? King Sudodana also heard that the Buddha was giving his teaching. So he wanted to invite the Buddha to come back to his hometown and give teaching in his hometown. So he sent one of his ministers along with 1,000 Sakyan men to go down to the uh, Magadha country and to invite the Buddha to come up to Sakyans and give the teaching. So they went down and they uh, went into Velavanna, which was the first monastery that had been set up in the Sasana. It had been given by King Bimbisara. And they went to Velavanna and then they heard the Buddha teach. Yeah. And all 1,001 of them attained arahatship on the spot. And because they attained arahatship, they forgot to give the message. Okay, so the message didn't get through. So the king 
seeing that nobody had come back, sent another minister with another 1,000 of his men to go and invite the Buddha, and same thing happened, and again and again. Nine times it happened, right? And then eventually, King Sudodana asked uh, Kaludai. Now, Kaludai is a very important figure. There are uh, seven uh, things that arose at the same time that the Buddha arose. Kaludai, who was a minister of Sudodana, was one of them. Okay? Yazodara, Siddhartha's wife, also arose on the same day that Siddhartha arose. Ananda, who was the, uh, the, the monk who remembered all the teachings, he also uh, was born on the same day. And then Channa, who led the uh, Siddhartha out from his hometown when he went on his renunciation, also rose the same day. And so did Kantaka, the horse that took the Buddha out. And also four golden treasure pots. So these seven things all arose on the same day that Siddhartha uh, 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 you know, was reborn. Okay. Uh, so Kaludai was one of those very important with what you can say is like a heart connection or a very close connection with Siddhartha, with uh, what had now become the Buddha. So uh, King Sudodana sent Kaludai down to uh, Magadha to invite the Buddha back to uh, Kapilavatu to come and teach the Sakyans. And then Kaludai and the 1,000 people also attained arahatship. Okay. But Kaludai didn't forget about the invitation. So he gave the invitation and he did it in a very nice way. He recited 64 verses in praise of the springtime in the Sakyan country to make the Buddha remember about his home country and how beautiful it is in the springtime with the flowers blossoming, you know, and all the little creatures running around in the woods and how the uh, sun is shining and everything like this. There's 64 verses that he recited to the Buddha and then the Buddha said, okay, I, w I will come come back to my hometown and give teachings there. Now that invitation happened on this full moon night. Yeah, It was on this full moon night the invitation took place. But the Buddha, of course, traveling now with 10,000 Magadans, Arahats, who had ordained, and 10,000 Sakyans, Arahats, who had ordained, 20,000 uh, Sangha, they walked from Magadha up to Kapilavattu. The 20,000 and more of them went back to Kapilavattu, you see. And they did it slowly. They just walked slowly back uh, to the home country. And it actually took 60 days for them to get there. So you can do the calculation yourself. If it took 60 days, they arrived actually at Vesak, yeah, on the Vesak full moon day. Right? So that's also an interesting and nice kind of uh, thing. You know, the Buddha at, had his birth at Vesak. He had his awakening at Vesak. Later, of course, he would have his Parinibbana at Vesak. But he also arrived back in his home city and was able to give teachings to his family at Vesak as well. 
So we should remember these things. There's many things involved in these full moon nights. Yeah, We remember the main events and then we forget some of the other events. Anyway, on the way he was slowly going like this. The king each day would send food down for him yeah, and for the monks so they were had enough food to come uh, back. And he would ask Kalu Dai about progress on the route. And then when the Buddha was close to arriving, they had to sort out accommodation. So there's 20,000 people are arriving. Yeah, You've got to have accommodation for them. So Nigroda, who was a very uh, senior minister in uh, King Sudodana's uh, government, he gave his park and they prepared one big park for the monks to stay in. Yeah. So when they arrived, the park, you see, was not too far from the city, so it's accessible by the lay people. Yeah. And it's not too close to the city, so it's not that the monks get disturbed. It's the right distance, like this. And then it's got streams flowing through it, so there's plenty of water. And there's plenty of trees in the park, so there's shade from the sun, and so on and so forth, like this. So a very suitable place for monastics to be living, you see. So this Negroda Park is where the Buddha arrived. And then the Sakyans went out to meet the Buddha and to greet him. But the Sakyans, you know, very, very proud people. Yeah. They're all uh, Katya uh, class of people. They look at themselves as the highest people in the, in the society. They're the rulers, the Rajas, and so on. They're the people who are leading the society, and they're a very proud people. So they sent the young people ahead. And the young people, when they met the Buddha, they got down and worshipped. Yeah? And they worshipped the monks as well. Yeah? But the elders, feeling that they're elder to young Siddhartha, he's only at that time 36 years old, and they're much senior to him, being in a senior position to him in a hierarchical society. Yeah. They came, but they wouldn't worship. Yeah. So the Buddha, in order to humble the Sakyans, performed what is called the double miracle. Now the Buddha performed this miracle on a number of occasions, but this is the first time that he performs it. Uh, and what he does is rise up into the sky, high into the sky, and then from one part of his body, he sets forth fire. And from the other part of his body, he sets forth water. It's called the double miracle because these two elements are opposite elements. Yeah. So it's called, in Pali, it's called Yamakapati Harya. So this Yamakapati Harya, sometimes it went from the left and the right, sometimes from the top and the bottom, like this. In all different ways, he made the two elements, projected it forward, and then, of course, the Sakyans were very impressed at this wonder working. And then he did something else, which was he made... a uh, stairway in the sky that went from one end of the universe across the sky to the other end of the universe. It was a jeweled walk. Yeah. And he walked up and down like, you know, like walking meditation, up and down in the sky like this, teaching Dhamma so the Sakyans could listen to Dhamma. It's at that point, actually, the Venerable Sariputta requested the Buddha to uh, teach about the previous Buddhas. 
And then the Buddha told what has come down to us as Buddha Wamsa. And it's from Buddha Wamsa that we have the stories of the 24 Buddhas who preceded our Lord Buddha. Their stories are told in that text. It's about over a thousand verses long. And it was told on this jeweled walk by the Buddha in front of the Sakyans who were... And then the Buddha came down from the uh, jeweled walk and then there was what is called a Pokharawasa. A Pokharawasa is a special type of rain. As you know, wasa, wasana, wasa means rain. But this was a special rain. Those who wanted to get wet got wet and those who didn't want to get wet were not touched by the rain at all. So this was called a Pokharawasa. And at that time, the Buddha taught about Vesantara Jataka. Vesantara Jataka includes a Pokharawasa, another occasion where this happened. And the Vesantara Jataka is also another very important teaching because it's the last time that the Buddha was in a human body before he took rebirth in his last life as Siddhartha. In fact, after that Jataka uh, story, he actually went to heaven and was residing in Tusita heaven. But his last human birth was as Visantara. Okay, so the Sakyans were humbled. They saw these miracles, they heard these teachings, and they got down and they worshipped the Lord Buddha and they worshipped the uh, Arahat Sangha. Now the next day, the Buddha looked around and he hadn't been given an invitation uh, for dana. So he reflected about it and he, uh, he asked himself, what did other Buddhas do in this on these occasions? And he realized that all other Buddhas, they went out on Pindapat. Yeah. So he decided to go Pindapat in his home city of Kapilavattu. And then he went into town and was going from door to door. Okay. And his wife, Yazodara, high up in the palace, looking out through a window, she saw her husband going on arms round. So she went and told the king that the Buddha was going on arms round and the king was very upset. He was very uh, shocked by this and he went out to meet the Buddha. Um, you must remember that the king had been sending food, you see, all the time that the Buddha was coming. So he must have been expecting the Buddha to come to the palace, but he hadn't given an invitation. So, you know, the Buddha went on Pindapat instead. And then um, the king went out and he said to the Buddha, he said, our class of people, the Katya class, the ruling class, never in, uh, in our lineage did anybody go out for arms. Yeah? Nobody goes for arms. That's for beggars and for poor people. Yeah, uh, But the Buddha said, that is your lineage. My lineage is the lineage of the Buddhas. And in the lineage of the Buddhas, we go out on Pindapat. Yeah. So the king was very impressed uh, by this. And the Buddha also at the same time gave uh, one teaching and this teaching is now recorded in the Dhammapada. Utite na pamajaya dhamman sucharitanchare dhammachari sukhan seti asmin loke paramhicha One should strive, not be heedless, 
one should practice the Dhamma well. One who lives the Dhamma sleeps happily in this world and the next. Okay, hearing that teaching, the king attained Sotapanna, yeah, the first stage of awakening. Many times we find in the early texts that, you know, if you were reborn in the Buddha's time, let alone as the Buddha's father, you see, people were very prime and very uh, ready to, uh, to hear the teaching and to benefit from it. Yeah. Even simple garters, simple verses like this, would just trigger people entering the stream and uh, beginning their journey to liberation. We hear it and we don't, okay. But in th that time, the people who got rebirth were already, you know, so much parami and everything to be reborn at the time of the Buddha. Anyway, the king then led the Buddha back to the palace. And then back in the palace, he recited a second verse. Dhamman chare su charitan, nanan du charitan chare, dhamma chari su kan seiti, as min loke paramhicha. One should practice the Dhamma well and not practice badly. One who lives the Dhamma sleeps happily in this world and the next. Hearing that verse, King Sudodana attained the third stage of awakening, anagami, right? So he's just one stage off arahatship at that point. And his queen, Mahapajapati Gotami, who had been the Buddha's foster mother, who was stood behind the king, she also heard the, uh, the gata and she attained Sotapanna, the first stage of awakening. Now, I'd carry on these stories about the king and the queen, okay? But this takes place now five years later, or actually four years later from this point, okay? But just to round up their stories, because later, when he was on his deathbed, yeah, the Buddha went to King Suddhodana as he was lying, dying, and he gave teachings to the king. And at that point, King Suddhodana attained arahatship. And he died on the same day. Yeah. He's one of the very few people who attained arahatship and never ordained. They tell in the text that if you attain arahatship, you either, ad, ad, you either ordain on that day or you die on that day. So there's a couple of instances like Bahia. Bahia attained and then he was run down by a bull and he died on this very day like that. Sudodana uh, was on his deathbed attained arahatship and died before he ordained, okay? So it was a lay arahat. So the, w the point about it is, of course, that there were occasions in the early teachings where we had lay arahats, not only monastics. Okay? And after he had died, Mahapajapati Gotami, the widowed queen, asked the Buddha, if she could ordain and go forth, yeah? And first of all, the Buddha uh, s said it's not suitable and he didn't give ordination. And um, Mahapajapati Gotami actually followed him down to Vaisali, about 200 kilometers south of Kapilavattu. The Buddha had retreated down to Vaisali. And she, she, along with 500 um, other Sakyan women, they walked down in very rough circumstances to Vaisali, and there they requested the Buddha again, and they got Ananda to help as well. 
and Ananda requested and reminded the Buddha about all that Mahapajapati Gotami had done for the Buddha and the Buddha agreed and that was the foundation of the Bhikshuni order and only a short time after that the Buddha gave a short teaching it's called Sankitta Sutta uh, the, the, the discourse in brief and Mahapajapati Gotami also attained arahatship. All right? Now we have to go back in time. We're back now in the palace at Vesak in the first year after the awakening. All right? The Buddha's wife right, is a very important thing, is a very important person, of course, because she had been his support throughout the ages. She had been reborn together with what became the Buddha through a hundred thousand aeons and they had got married together so many times. It's mentioned in many of the Jatikas that Yasodhara was the wife of the person who would become Siddhartha later and then the, the Buddha, you see, like this. So they also had this strong heart connection and they were going through samsara, being reborn together. And this is an important thing to do with rebirth because if you have a very close connection with somebody, it might be a very close heart connection, but it might be a different connection. For instance, Devadatta also gets reborn with Siddhartha many times. Why? Because there was this animosity between them. Devadatta, it was always trying to put down Siddhartha, right? Because of this close connection, they got reborn together. If you've got somebody you're very close to, very much in love with, you might get reborn with them. If you've got somebody that you very much hate and despise, you might also get reborn with them. Okay? So this is one of the things that happens in samsara. You have to be, uh, you know, careful, if you like. Right? So, anyway, Yasodhara had been re uh, reborn with Siddhartha through all this period and had been his support for all that time. And then... A uh, funny thing happened, really. Uh, the Buddha was in the palace. Yasodhara refused to come and see him. And she said, if I have ever been a support for the Buddha during this long period through samsara, he will come and see me. And the Buddha agreed. Right? So it's quite an interesting thing, I think. The Buddha went to the uh, princess's chambers. And then another very funny thing happened, which was that Yasodhara threw herself at the Buddha's feet and grabbed him round the ankles and cried all over his feet. It's also a very surprising thing that you wouldn't think would have happened because you feel like Buddhas are untouchable, if you like. You know, you can't even touch a monk, you know, and this is the Buddha, you see. But he allowed it to happen, yeah. And um, then the Buddha at that time told the Chanda Kinnari Jataka, which is one very famous Jataka where the Buddha, Siddhartha, or the Bodhisattva, if you like, and Yasodhara had been born. This Chanda Kinnari Jataka, also a very important and uh, um, a famous Jataka story. I can't tell it uh, tonight because too much else to tell. But he told that Jataka at that time. Okay. And then, just to wind up with Yasodhara's story, again, five years later, when Mahapajapati Gotami had received permission to. Uh, ordained, Yasodhara also ordained and she also became an arahat. Yeah. 
In fact, even when the Bodhisattva had gone forth, Suddhodana told the Buddha, he, he told, told him, you know, when you went forth and you took off your finery, threw it away, and just put on rags at home, Yazodara also took off her finery and she just put on old clothes. Yeah. And when she heard that the, bo the Bodhisattva was only taking one meal a day during his austerities, yeah, then Yasodhara herself only took one meal a day. Yeah. And when she heard uh, that the uh, Buddha was not sleeping in a comfortable bed or wearing scents or leading a comfortable life, she also just put a mat, you know, on, on the floor, just rolled out a mat on the floor, and she slept on the floor, and she stopped using perfumes and so on like this. So, emulating what the Bodhisattva was doing during his uh, period of austerities, you see, so close was their connection like this. So later, she also, when she could, when the nun's order had been established, she also ordained and uh, she became uh, also a very famous nun uh, uh, who could remember, because of this uh, connection, you see, she could remember all the lives that she'd lived with the Bodhisattva and she was uh, singled out as the person who could remember uh, for one immeasurable period and a hundred thousand aeons the lives that she had lived together with the Buddha, uh, you know, with the Bodhisattva. Okay? That's Yasodhara's story. So now we've got Yasodhara has also attained arahatship. The Buddha also had a brother, a younger brother, who had been born two or three days after he was born, called Nanda. Yeah. When Nanda was born, Mahapajapati, he was born to Mahapajapati Gotami, it was his half-brother. Mahapajapati Gotami gave Nanda out for somebody else to suckle, and she took Siddhartha to suckle. Yeah. So she looked after Siddhartha, which was her sister's son, and a nurse looked after her own son called Nanda. Okay, so this is the Buddha's half brother. So as he was leaving the palace after the uh, after all these events that had taken place in the palace, the uh, king had attained Anagami, the uh, queen had attained Sotapanna. Uh, and so on and so forth. After all these events, he was leaving the palace, he gave his bowl to Nanda. And Nanda didn't know what to do. He, he got the bowl, and he, he doesn't know, you know, he doesn't like to say anything or do anything. So he just kind of took the bowl, and he followed after the Buddha. And the Buddha is walking out, you see, to uh, Nigrodharama, like this. And he's thinking, you know, well, anyway, when we get there, you know, I can give the bowl back to the Buddha and uh, it will be okay. Because the next day, Nanda was expecting to be anointed as the crown prince. And not only that, but he was also expecting to get married to his sweetheart. And she waved at him and said, come back soon, come back soon, like this. And uh, Nanda was looking behind, you know, thinking, I'm going to come back soon, you know. It's my marriage day tomorrow, right? But when he got to the park, the Buddha actually uh, didn't take the bowl. He called Sariputta, and he told Sariputta to ordain Nanda, right? So Nanda didn't like to say no, yeah, because it's the Buddha, you know. He, he performs miracles and you know walks across the universe and gives all these teachings and 
everything like this. He didn't like to say no, so he just had to go along with it, but he didn't really want to ordain because all the time he's thinking about his wife-to-be and, you know, his nuptials on the next day, <laughs> on the following day. So, uh, so Nanda, although he was ordained, he was not happy with his ordination and he actually wanted to disrobe. So the story went round that Nanda was unhappy living the brahmachari, the spiritual life, and he wanted to uh, disrobe. So the Buddha, using his skillful means, his upaya, he decided uh, to uh, uh, give a special lesson, if you like, to Nanda. And then he said, come Nanda, we will go to Tarvatimsa. And Nanda said, I can't go to Tarvatimsa. I don't have any powers or anything like that. Not like the Arahats. He said, you know, I actually, I want to disrobe and go home, you know, <laughs> like this. And uh, the Buddha said, don't worry. He said, I'll take you by the arm, right, and we'll go up to Tarvatimsa. So the Buddha grabbed him by the arm and they started flying through the air. And one of the things they flew over was actually a burned out forest. Yeah. And in this burned out forest, there was a monkey, a female monkey, sat on the branch of a tree. And this monkey had been in the fire and she was all burned out. All her hair was burned out and she was scarred from the fire and in a terrible and disheveled state like that. So anyway, Nanda saw and Buddha saw, but still they carried on and they went up to Tarvatimsa heaven. And when they were in Tarvatimsa heaven, the Buddha showed 500 apsaras, you know, heavenly maidens, if you like, beautiful, uh, heavenly females in heaven. And the Buddha said to Nanda, you know, who is more beautiful, these 500 apsaras, heavenly maidens, or your wife-to-be? And Nanda said, compared to these apsaras, then my wife-to-be is just like that burned-out monkey that we saw on the way, <laughs> way up. Okay. It's got nothing compared to these heavenly apsaras. And then the Buddha told Nanda, if you live the brahmachari with me and you put forth effort, then I promise you, you will attain these 500 apsaras at the end of it. Okay, so Nanda, you know, got interested in leading the spiritual life. And then he took him back down to earth and he started living more ardently, living the spiritual life more ardently. But the other monks heard what the bargain was, that if he uh, lived out the spiritual life, he would get these celestial women like this. And they started criticizing him and saying that, you know, he was actually uh, living the spiritual life, uh, you know, for, you know, trading. He was just like a hireling. He was like a lackey, somebody who had been bought, somebody who was not living the life properly. Yeah. You're supposed to be living the life for the sake of Nibbana, not for the sake of heavenly women. Okay. And then shame overcame Nanda and he decided to start living the life properly. And uh, he really put forth energy and effort and he attained Nibbana at that time. And then you know, he thought, oh, I got this bargain with the Buddha. I must go and tell the Buddha, you know, I don't need these celestial women anymore. Yeah? It's not necessary anymore. Uh, I've attained arahatship. So he went and he met the Buddha and uh, he told him, 
And the Buddha said, you know, the very moment you attained arahatship, I knew it. And the very moment you, took, you attained arahatship, I was released from that promise I had given you. Yeah. Like this. Now this story, you know, is told as an example of upaya, skillful means, the way that the Buddha, through using uh, uh, skillful means, managed to bring somebody to a higher state than they actually intended to get to, like this. Upaya, as you know, becomes a very important doctrine in the Mahayana later. And there's many stories, for instance, in Lotus Sutra about how the Buddhas used upaya, skillful means, to bring people to higher stages than they actually were looking for. But the root of that story is actually contained, uh, the, the root of that idea is actually contained in the early texts with this story about uh, Nanda. That story is actually found in the Udana. Okay? So, now, also, Nanda has attained Arahatship. All right? Only one left to go. The Buddha, back in Kapilavattu now, was in the city, and Yasodhara, his previous wife, or still his wife in a way, his previous wife sent uh, their son, Rahula, who was by that time seven years old, yeah, sent Rahula out to claim his inheritance from his father. Yeah, his father was a great prince, and uh, uh, Rahula had his inheritance coming. And she actually uh, told very... Uh, wonderful uh, garters that have come down to us as the Narasiya Gata, in which she describes the uh, wonderful appearance of the Buddha. Yeah? And having described it to Rahula, described her father, his father to Rahula, she sent him out for the, his inheritance. So Rahula, a young boy, went out and he started tugging at the Buddha's robes and saying, give me my inheritance, give me my inheritance. And all the way back to Nigrodharama, he's calling on the Buddha and pulling on his robes like this. Yeah. And when he got back there, again, the Buddha told Sariputta, give him ordination. So they, he ordained him as a Samanera. King Sudodana was very, very upset about this situation because you must understand first of all he's lost Siddhartha Siddhartha was the prince who would become the king when Suddhodana passed away right the follow up when Siddhartha was not available is Nanda yeah and now Nanda has just attained arahatship and is not going to is not going to become the uh, king either so his last hope is Rahula, yeah? And now the Buddha's gone and ordained Rahula as well. So the king went to the Buddha and he told, you know, this is not right actually. You shouldn't just ordain young boys without getting their parents' permission. They must have permission first. And you know, now even to this day, it's, it's necessary for anybody to ordain even they're my age, even, you know, they're 60 years old, if their parents are alive, they must have the permission of their parents. Yeah. They cannot simply ordain. They must have permission from their parents. And the reason for that is because of this situation that arose with Rahula. Now, Rahula ordained, and there's many teachings in the Tripitaka, a uh, number of suttas that were taught to Rahula, uh, the Chula Rahula Awada Sutta, the Maha Rahul Awada Sutta, and a number of other uh, very important suttas in the Majjhimanikaya and elsewhere. Um, these suttas were taught to Rahula, and 
uh, he developed meditation and so on and so forth. And when he came 13 years later, he was 20 years old, he was eligible for Upasampata, Bhikshu ordination. So the Buddha arranged his Bhikshu ordination. And at that time, he also gave a teaching to Rahula, and Rahula also attained Arahatship. So, you see, now starting with this invitation that happened on this night, the Pagana Punyamasa night, you see how consequences develop from that time. The Buddha with the 20,000 Arahats goes back to uh, uh, Kapilavatu. He gives teachings. He converts his home people. Yeah, The king eventually attains Arahatship. The queen attains Arahatship. Yasodhara eventually attains Arahatship. And Nanda also attains Arahatship. So it ties in, you know, with something that we've talked about a number of times before, which is, you know, we always say that you can't pay back your parents. Yeah. You can't pay back your parents for what your parents have done for you. In a way, you can't pay, pay back your family, you know. But it's for, of course, it's especially important you can't pay back your parents because your parents, you know, they looked after you when you were l young. They cleaned you up when you were dirty. Yeah. And they brought you up, fed you, gave you your education, clothed you, everything that they did for you, how can you pay that back? But they tell there is one way that you can pay back uh, your parents, and that is by teaching them Dhamma. If you bring the Dhamma into your parents' life, or you know, to extend it into the life of your family, or to extend it again into the life of your family, you're paying back what those people have done for you. So it's a really important thing uh, to try to do is to bring the Dhamma to your family and to bring uh, more people into uh, you know, the sphere of the teaching. In a way, it doesn't mean that they become Buddhist, you know. That's not important. If, if they stop doing bad things and they start doing good things, and they do something about developing their mind, it doesn't matter what they call themselves, yeah? Those are the important things, yeah? They, they must, you know, put aside bad things. It will only lead to bad things happening to them. Nobody wants bad things to happen to their parents. Nobody wants bad things to happen to their family or friends, yeah? So there's various ways that it can be done. Of course, you can uh, bring them to Dhamma teachings. You yourself can give Dhamma teachings to them if you can't preach or anything like that. It doesn't matter. You can also pass out Dhamma books. Yeah? Or you can, if you, that doesn't work also for various reasons, there might be occasions when it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. You can just set a good example. If people see that you yourself have benefited from the Dhamma, yeah, they themselves will be inspired to follow uh, the teachings. They will see that the teachings have made a difference in your life and they will be inspired to inquire more and to uh, live out the life themselves. Okay, so everybody say sadhu.